All right, guys, welcome back to the Bluegrass, and we got a quick little video for you today about Charcoal Labs. Uh, so on that table, you see we have a chocolate lab, a yellow lab, a black lab, and then show them that one on the end, Eli. That, my friends, is what they call a charcoal lab, and that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, you know, a few weeks ago, uh, you know, I made a video about silver labs, and what silver labs are, uh, is they're just uh, chocolate labs that have a dilute uh, gene. So, the you know, you get some parents that have these recessive dilute genes get mated up and next thing you know you have a silver lab. Well, same thing happens with the black ones, only you end up with a charcoal one. And so there's some, uh, there's some uh, points of contention in the dog world as to, uh, you know, like where that color came from and, uh, you know, what are the qualities of these kind of dogs. And that's what we're going to talk about in this little video. Okay, now, so what we're going to do is we'll go ahead, oh, and we'll let, now listen, I have to go ahead and and get my bias out of the way, okay guys? Because I, like everybody, I have my own inherent bias. And uh, what I believe is that all dogs want to be labs and all labs want to be black. So before you go any farther in this video, or if you're getting your emailing or commenting fingers ready to make comments, I'll just go ahead and reveal my own bias, right? All dogs want to be labs, all labs want to be black. And that's the one you ought to get. <laughs> Uh, now, but I see lots of these other guys. I mean, uh, look at Doc. Doc's an awesome chocolate lab. His mom couldn't be happier with him. And uh, right here we have Ollie. And look how pretty Ollie is. Ollie actually lives in Manhattan. And uh, so if you'll think back to my video about uh, kind of uh, field bred dogs versus uh, bench bred dogs or show dogs, uh, really which kind of is, is what gets referred to in the states as uh, American kind of labs versus English kind of labs. This is what uh, people would refer to as, a, as an English lab. You know, he's got uh, he's a real cool dog, real good looking dog, real chill, real mellow, got a very resilient temperament, a low to maybe moderate energy level, low to moderate endurance, and it makes this dog able to live in a place like Manhattan where say another dog that I'm going to show you guys, Charlie or my dog or Doc, show him Doc there Eli. You wouldn't want to live in an apartment with Doc, I can just go ahead and tell you that. But you can see how there's some structural dissimilarities between say Doc and come over here and look at, let's just go ahead and stand this guy here up a little bit so you can see if I can get him to stand up. Oh. You see how thick he is, kind of how big his head is, let me get his head up for you. Look at that. Okay. So you'll notice he looks a little bit different than some of these other dogs. And as a result, I have to take kind of some different precautions. Like uh, you saw that little dog I was just holding up a second ago. When they first get here, I got to kind of help them up on the, onto the obstacles and off the obstacles. And I have to do that a lot more than with say, look at that dog, Eli. Doc, you see Doc's a little rangier, a little skinnier, just kind of looks a little bit more athletic. Okay, but let's get back to this dog right here. Let's take a second and talk about what Bodie is and where he came from. So stay there for a second, Bodie. Now kind of get up there and look at him a little bit, Eli. Look at him from the side so everybody can see what we're dealing with. Okay, and Bodie's a good dog, good sport, sitting up there in the heat. But he is a charcoal lab. And a charcoal lab, you get those by crossing parents that carry recessive dilute genes. Now if you uh, cross chocolate parents that carry the recessive dilute gene, you get a silver. So you get charcoal, silver, and sometimes you get what's called champagne. Now the big uh, source of uh, debate in the come on buddy the big source of debate in the labrador world is you know where where did those recessive genes come from and there's basically two schools of argument uh, aficionados of this breed uh, this or this version of the labrador retriever breed say that those recessive genes have been there all along and it just took a little while wait for them to pop up okay now, uh, when you say, well, like, look, those, they, they never popped up before. So they, they didn't pop up for years and years and years. What breeders of these kinds of dogs will say is, yes, they did. They did pop up. It's just that uh, they were cold when they were puppies. So back in the day, if you had a litter of 10 puppies, if uh, two of those puppies had coat variations that you didn't like, or if they had some type of physical characteristic that, you, that wasn't suitable, then what breeders would do is what's called culling. Now, culling just means that they would euthanize those puppies early, and uh, the reason they were doing it is because they were concerned with the overall genetic health and suitability and reproducibility of, of a dog breed. And that's kind of how that works, right? In the 1950s, though, these dogs started popping up for sale, silver dogs. Now, 
Did that just happen? Did those bloodlines just converge at that point? I don't know. It does seem kind of sketchy that the kennels that started selling these dogs, uh, they were closely associated with, bring, with breeding Weimaraners who also carried that dilute gene. So is it possible that these dogs just, uh, you know, were always popping up in litters and were being culled and that's why nobody saw them? Sure, of course it is. Is it also possible that, uh, you know, you had some people in the 1950s that decided that introducing uh, Weimaraner genes into the Labrador would produce a color and a set of behavioral tendencies that were suitable, that would add something to the uh, breed? That is too, right? And we even have a third possibility. Is it possible that people introduced this color not to increase uh, the, uh, the, the, the overall quality of the breed, but simply as a marketing tool? Yep, that's also possible. So all of those things are possible, and until we get some better genetic testing, we're not going to really be able to get to the end of it. It's just a, a source of, of endless argument on the internet. Each one of these videos that I've made uh, has resulted in hundreds of emails of, pe me, of, of people, sent, people sending me hundreds of emails, okay, telling me how, like, the, the other kind of person was wrong. So you get aficionados of these dilute versions of Labrador Retrievers and they're like they're making good convincing arguments right and they're like Stoney that color's always been there people called them and uh, it's unfair for you to, to to say that they were they were mixed with Weimaraners or whatever okay and uh, then <laughs> what's crazy is that uh, and I'm trying to be as fair as I can but I get a lot, a lot even a lot more emails from people that consider themselves Labrador experts and they criticize me for even featuring these types of dogs on my channel. And I'm like, look, I didn't come up with those kind of dogs. I just, my channel is about talking, you know, about things that are going on in my, at my place. And so when I get these dogs in, look at him from the side here, Eli. You see, he's a little rangier, maybe, you know, than some labs, but not much. Really, the, the big difference with these guys, come up here and sit, look at this coat, Eli, is this right here. This is the real problem with all these dilutes is their coat is just not exactly right and a lot of them suffer from a condition uh, the, the general condition is called follicular dysplasia. It's like a malformed, uh, you know, hair follicle uh, but uh, what they call it in these dilutes is dilute coat alopecia. In other words, they lose their hair up through here. And I've also noticed that they kind of be a little bit, these guys are a little bit more sensitive to environmental uh, uh, things. You know, like if we, if we go out in a brush a lot uh, and these guys get some scratches on them, they seem to be a little bit more likely to get infections. You know, I mean, they just kind of pop up overnight. Now that could just be my own you know, I mean, it's anecdotal. It could just be my own experience, but it could be true. But anyway, that's where these dogs come from, and that's kind of why we're making this video today, is so you can see this. But <clears throat> what we're going to do next is we're just going to talk about, I'm going to get some other lab puppies out, and we're going to talk about what are the real world differences between the dogs. Because this whole time that I've been talking to you, hadn't Bodie been minding well? He was sitting up on the table like a champ. He let Eli get over and look at him with the camera. He's uh, mastered, obviously he's mastered the exercise with small challenges course to the point where, uh, you know, I can walk him with one finger, no treats, and uh, I don't even really have to tell him what to do. He understands what's expected from a situational perspective. Like if we're walking and something's in the way, he knows to avoid it. You know, my ability to influence him like with subtle gestures. Look at that. That's pretty easy, right? That's nice. Uh, it's easy to get him in the pool. So from a practical point of view, he's a pretty good fella, no? Right? <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about some of these other issues. Okay, so that brings us this question about are dilutes purebred dogs or not, okay? And so what people love to throw the dilutes under the bus about is they don't meet the breed standard. Okay, but look at this. We got two dogs here. Uh, and you notice that one it's super chill and lazy. All right, but uh, so this guy over here is Charlie. He's a field bred dog. This is Ollie. Ollie's a bench bred dog, you know. So what people, again, what they talk about is like American versus English, whatever. But they're, both these dogs came from America, so they're both Americans. But you see the variance between these dogs? Nobody's going to email me. When I show these dogs, nobody emails me and throws uh, either one of these dogs under the bus. You have people that like these kind of dogs. They're like, oh, these dogs are kind of homely. 
And then people that like these kind of dogs are like Stony. Those dogs are you know worthless. They won't fetch a bird. They won't do anything. Okay, but there's a, quite a bit of of, of uh, you know difference between those two types of Labradors. Yet nobody really gets particularly upset when you know when you're when you're making videos about them. Show them that one over there, Eli. You put one dilute on your channel, and uh, you know people get pretty crazy. So what we're going to do is, y'all have already seen Bodie walking on the course. So now we'll walk Charlie and we'll walk Ollie and we'll see how much difference there is between those three kinds of dogs. Now again, right off the bat, you're going to notice I do not have to help Charlie off of here. I do have to help Ollie off because he's still in that kind of clumsy stage and these English bred dogs are always just a little bit clumsy, ain't they Eli? Oh yeah. <laughs> now what else you're going to notice is like just the general pace of Ollie's movement is a little bit slower so we're going to come up here and i got to kind of give him a little more help come on buddy come on now this is what we're going to see throughout the whole course is me having to help this guy having to give him a little extra encouragement good have to give him a little bit more food and one of the main reasons is is it's about 94 degrees today and these little you know square squatty stocky dogs they don't do too well in the heat you know very nice. Now he's still doing all this stuff. You know, he's a nice fella. He's got a good temperament. It's real chill. Everybody likes him. Everybody talks about how pretty he is. Oh, Charlie, you go over there. But look at this right here. You see how he's just kind of slow with everything that he does. Now another thing is we're not going to get very many repetitions with Ollie. What we have to do with Ollie is we have to get a repetition and then let him rest. And then get a repetition and then let him rest. And we have to be real careful with you know how physically taxing uh, we make these activities because this is what we're going to get a lot of the time so you know people look at this and they say well that dog's stubborn stony nah, he's not stubborn these things are just hard for him you know like you got to remember this dog's bred to be very pretty oh and here's another one <laughs> uh, let me pick this one up so you guys can see all right so look at these two you know how i always say <laughs> let me put these two right here together Look here, talk to me, Eli, so that, so, that, so that you can see them. Oh, look, you know how I always say Miss America doesn't know how to cook eggs? <laughs> That's why these dogs don't know how to mind, because they're bred to be so pretty that everybody just wants to pick them up and love on them, not hold them to a big high standard. Okay, let's go back to working Ollie here. Come on, buddy. Now, look, so Ollie's going to give me a little hard time here. Now I'm going to have to, like, give him a little help. Oh, you can do it. Come on, very nice. You have to be very patient. Now with Bodie, Bodie, even though he came here a little bit later in life, uh, we didn't have to be very patient with Bodie at all. What, what was it, about two days, Eli, before Bodie was up and running over this stuff? Two days. Two days, you know, so there's a mark tells you charcoal labs are okay, you know, like they're pretty physically fit, good. Now see, Bodie's gonna do this, but I want y'all, if you want to, back up this video and look and see how, uh, and look and see how Bodie's doing it. Look and see how, like the just the basic motivation level, the energy level. Good. And then you might say, well, Stoney, that's not fair. Bodie's older. Okay. All right. I'll show you another little field bred dog. That's about the same age as this guy. Good. Very nice. And again, it's not that this guy can't do this stuff. You can go back to my English versus American lines, and you can see that we drag, uh, you know, both types of dogs to all of our activities. We just make sure that we have a fair, uh, you know, set of criteria for what we consider uh, success for each dog. It's not fair to hold different kinds of dogs to the same standard. So all you can really do is ask them to do the best they can. So each day we come out here, we just ask Ollie to do a little better than what he did yesterday. Come on. Very nice. Up, up. Very nice. Okay, so we're just about done, but we're going to go ahead and come on, you can do it. Easy. Look at there. Come on, buddy. You can do it. Now, you see how many times I'm having to stop and give these treats and stuff with this little fella? Okay, that's just kind of par for the course with these uh, bench bred dogs. Very nice. Good boy. Okay, so we'll come back over here. So you see that I did the same thing with Ollie that I just did with Bodie. Did exactly the same thing. What was the difference? I had to help Ollie a little, uh, you know, not a little more, a lot more. Okay, so look. <laughs> oh, Ollie's so self-important. He's like, just pick me up, dude. Now here's a little pit bull mix. 
this dog just does her own thing all day long. Sometimes, like, see, these dogs, they look like that, they're a little bit too dependent, right? Then you get you a good old street dog, and they're a little bit too independent. So now everything, you know, kind of works on a sliding scale here. All right, so I'm gonna take this leash off of Ollie. And I've got to put Ollie down, because if I don't put him down, he's gonna stay here all day in this hot sun. Because <laughs> he, he would rather be hot than to put forth the effort to get out of the sun. All right, so come on. Now this is Charlie. Oh my gosh, Charlie, you're a good dog. Now, I want you to compare Charlie, who's not too, too awful much older than Ollie. A couple months, good. But look how fast I can move, right? And also notice, up, up, that I don't have to use too awful many. Okay, how many of y'all getting on there? Good. You don't have to use too awful many treats. Good. Very nice. Easy. Wait. Perfect. Easy. Up. Now, do you notice a, like a, a big difference here, right? A big difference in the overall like uh, balance and go on street dog but the overall balance and energy level and motivation level watch i'm going to do this one more time and i'm just going to talk to charlie a little bit so that you can see how animated these field uh, dogs get when you talk to them oh come on charlie you're a good boy oh my gosh you're a very nice dog oh my gosh now this is what oh i almost got him too excited here oh my gosh easy very nice but you see how how I can just change my vocal inflection up, up, a little bit. Easy. Wait. Easy. And I get a completely different energy level from the dog. That's why people love these field bred dogs when it comes to training. Oh, because if you model the right behavior, then they'll give it right back to you. Look at that. Good. Very nice. See, and all I had to do, I didn't have to like change my treats. I didn't have to give a special treat. I just had to start acting like I was happier. Now I can calm him down. Easy. Wait. I'll do the course one more time and I'll be real calm and uh, I will model calm, attentive behavior for him. Easy. Very nice. Now see, I've changed my vocal inflection. Now look at the dog's demeanor. Wait till I get over here in the sun so you can see it better. Easy. Nice. Very nice. Pay attention to what we're doing. Concentrate. So with these field bred labs, it's super easy to help them get in the right mindset for a given training exercise or an, an adventure or a job, you know? Like, uh, I just came around this course and I was being real excited. The dog was real excited. Now, I'm being very calm. And look at the dog. He's being very calm. He's being very deliberate. Oh, stop. Easy. Very nice. See how I'm talking in low tones, drawing my syllables out. Very nice. Easy. Easy. Very nice. Good. <laughs> Wait. Very nice. Now look at this little street dog back here. Getting a little love. We'll give this dog some love. Very nice. Good. <clears throat> All right, now we'll go back over here to the table and look inside this, uh, <laughs> look inside this pool, because I think Doc has gotten himself, oh, he got himself out, didn't he? All right, so. A minute ago, you heard a dog kind of yipping and yapping. Well, what had happened is uh, Doc had bailed off into the, into the uh, pool, and he was trying to act like he couldn't get out of the pool. Uh, but then, by the time we got over here, he had managed to extricate himself from that situation. Now, see, both of these dogs, you know, a little bit more on that field-bred side. And so, like, see how much more adventurous they are, how much more sure-footed they are, their overall energy level is a little bit higher. Okay, guys, come on, come on. Come on, come on. Now, look what I got over here. <laughs> Laying in the shade behind the pool. <laughs> now see, this is a shade layer right here. That's what we call them, shade layers, right? Now look at Charlie. He's in and out, moving. All right, so I'll do the same thing with Doc that I did with Charlie. Come on, give him a little help. Ah, and again, I want you to watch the dog's demeanor. So I'll go kind of fast the first time. Good boy, Charlie.
Very nice. Oh, you're a good boy. Oh, come on, you can do it. Now see my voice and, and my, my posture's upbeat? Good. Easy. Now watch, I'm gonna kind of go fast. Up, 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 up. Very nice. Oh my gosh, up, 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 up. Good. Easy. Wait, let Eli, this dog's so fast, I gotta let Eli get into, sp into his spot before I start moving. Easy. Good, now I'm getting excited again. Oh my gosh, up, 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 up. Oh, oh, oh my gosh. Oh, easy. Wait, street dog behind me gets paid. Street dog to the side gets paid. Easy. Very nice. Good dog. Oh, you're a good dog. Get a little excited again. Come on, up, 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 up. I'm gonna go over these two jumps. Come down through here. Up, 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 up. Up, up, up. Good. Up. Watch. Wait. Do you see how responsive the dog is to my posture? Easy. Very nice. Up, up. Oh, good dog. Come on, come on. Let's go fast. Let's go fast. Oh, my gosh. Come on, come on. Up, 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 up. Stay. See that? See that responsiveness? Right? That's why people like these field-bred dogs. They're so responsive. Now, why do people sometimes not like them? Well, uh, listen guys, you can't put this dog... Ollie lives on something like the 24th, 25th, 26th floor of a big building in Manhattan. Like, you can't put this dog up there. I mean, like, you get kicked out because he would be bouncing off the walls. Uh, but now, if you got a chance to exercise these dogs and you need them to be calm, all you have to do is set the emotional stage. Watch, I'll do it. It'll be real easy. Very nice. Very nice. Wait there for a second. Let it. Now, easy. Now, I want you to stay nice and calm and show all the people how well field bred dogs can match emotional states. Wait. Your mom will be proud. Your breeder will be proud. Everybody will be proud of you. Good. Easy. Very nice. Now see, there's dogs doing all kinds of stuff, digging in those tunnels, climbing behind him, running over Doc, and Doc doesn't care. He's just taking his cues from me. He's saying, okay, I'm going to be chill because Stoney's being chill. Oh, and then we have these street dogs. Go on, street dogs. We had to make a video on them here in a day or two. They've been giving me a hard time, but I finally got them moving in the right direction. Good. But again, watch. See? Nice and easy. Good. Now see, I just did the same course and I got the same behavior, but I was able to do it in an excited state uh, just by being excited myself. Then I come back around and I'm able to do it in a very calm state just by being very calm myself. Everything else is the same. Wait. So I was able basically to control the dog's energy level by uh, controlling my own energy level. And that's a super important part, guys. You can get these real trainable dogs like this, but if you're not good at controlling your own energy level, then you're gonna have trouble with them. A lot of people get these dogs and uh, you know they, they're a little too hectic with their training or they try to you know make their training progress a little too quickly. Good. Very nice, stay there. And uh, then you know they'll call me and they'll be like, Stoney, I got this dog and he keeps doing stuff, but he keeps doing the wrong stuff. Well, like what happens sometimes is, you know, you're, when you're showing them what to do, you get a little frustrated. And when you get a little frustrated, these field bred dogs like Charlie and Doc there, that frustration, you saw how like they match my energy level around the course. Well, when you get frustrated with them, that same thing happens that they'll match your frustration level. So if you have these field bred dogs and you feel like that dog's being hard headed, then more than likely you are doing a very poor job in terms of modeling the type of behavior that you would like to see. And, uh, my experience is about 90% of the time when these field dogs mess up, uh, it's because there's not enough uh, patience and proper self-control from their handlers. Ah, stay. Like see right there where he got up? Well, he got up because Eli was over there with that camera getting close to him and then Eli went to move away. And so he's like, well, I wonder what Eli's doing. So that's a mistake made out of exuberance. So I don't, uh, I don't fuss at him for mistakes made out of exuberance. Good. Okay, very nice. You're a very good dog. Okay, so we'll continue this conversation while we walk Sadie. Oh, come on, Sadie. Now, Sadie's a nice little white lab. And you might say, well, Stoney, what do you mean she's a white lab? I thought you said that uh, Labradors are only black, chocolate, and yellow. Well, yep, as far as registration is concerned, that's what they are, you know. 
So this dog is registered as a yellow Labrador Retriever. But like you're looking at her, she look yellow to you? No, nope, of course not. And then a lot of times on my channel, you'll see the, you know, the fox red dogs and uh, they're pretty dang red, but I get zero emails. You know, these dogs, they didn't even exist when I was a kid. And then all of a sudden, about 10 years ago, they started getting popular. And I have featured dozens and dozens of these white labs on my channel, you know. And I get nothing but positive feedback. Uh, I've got one cool little series um, uh, about search and rescue training I did for a lady from Virginia. And uh, it's got a little dog on it named Holmes. Still to this day, one of my favorite little dogs. You should check that series out if you get a chance. But, like, uh, I've, over the years, I've got hundreds of emails about how cute Holmes was and how neat he was. And, you know, where could you get a dog like Holmes and whatever. And so people don't seem to mind that Holmes is white instead of yellow. Because they'll say, oh, Stoney, those are all just variations of a color. It doesn't matter. Okay, you know. Then why get so fired up if the variations of a color uh, are silver or charcoal? And you might say, well, it's only because of the health issues. Sure, sure, there are some health issues, right? But there are some health, health issues with uh, all of these different bloodlines of labs. You know, that's why you're always, at, everybody's after these tests. There's elbow dysplasia and hip dysplasia, the eye test. You know, remember what I told you in the silver lab video, a lot of these, this dog's got nice tight eyes, but a lot of the, a lot, a lot of bench bred dogs, they have the ectopian eyes that kind of hang down like that. So there's lots of reasons to get fired up. It's just something about mixing labs with wine Raiders <laughs> that freaks people out okay uh, so let's take one more look at Bodie and let's tie all this together and then you can go out and make whatever decision that you want to make Bodie come on all right so we're gonna walk Bodie one more time then I'm gonna show you something kind of cool come on Bodie and tie all these things together so what are the knocks on uh, these dilute dogs Number one, and uh, the most deserved knock on them, is the fact that they do have coat issues, you know. Now, not all of them have uh, the same degree of coat issues, but I have yet to see one that doesn't have, like, a little bit of a weird coat. Now, Bodie's coat's pretty nice, you know what I'm saying? But it's not like, nice like Mr. No Names, that's for sure. Uh, but other than that, you know, like, what's the real difference? Uh, you notice, like, uh, when you go to buying a dog, what are you interested in? Okay, what you're interested in is can the dog come and be still and have good manners? Is it good with your kids? Can it get along well with other dogs? If you, you know, buying a Labrador Retriever, you might want to, you know, make sure it fetches, right? And Bodie likes to fetch a little bit. Does he like to fetch like Charlie or my dog No Name or Doc, the field bred dogs? Nope. But he likes to fetch a hundred times more than Ollie, you know. Uh, or I have two English bred dogs, Norton and B. And uh, <laughs> when you go to talking about fetching, they just laugh at you. You know, <laughs> they just look at you and like, hey, you, how about this? You throw it, and then uh, you bring it back to me, <laughs> and uh, you can throw it again, and I'll watch. Okay. So Bodie fetches well. He gets along with everybody. It's obvious that he can master the course. He's good at matching my emotional state. He's got a pretty good energy level. And then one of the most important things in the world that people don't think about with the lab standard is how do they do in the water. Watch, I don't have any trouble getting Bodie to go in the water. He goes in there and hangs out. And uh, he likes the water to uh, a much greater extent than a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of bench bred dogs. Come on, Bodie. Show him. Look at this. Like Bodie loves playing in the hose. Now, I'll, get, I'll get over this way, way Eli, so you can see. Uh, But Bodie loves playing in the hose. He likes getting in the water. Good boy. Oh, you a good dog. <laughs> Look, I could probably get him all the way up in the pool. Let's see if I can get him in the pool. <laughs> Come on, Bodie. Oh, it's a good dog. Come on, Bodie. Very nice. Okay, so look here. Just to kind of put this whole video together, I want you to take a look at this dog playing in this water. There's two key elements to having a Labrador Retriever from my perspective. Uh, the first is that the dog likes to retrieve, and the second is that the dog likes to play in the water, right? If a dog's not a good swimmer, if it doesn't like to get in the water, if it's afraid of the water or whatever, then, you know, I'm, man, I have a hard time thinking of that dog as really matching the breed standard. I mean, look at that dog back there. He jumps right in the water all by himself. Okay, so does that dog back there have any Weimaraner in him? No, he doesn't look like it to me. <laughs> that dog, you could take him all the way back to the uh, late 1800s, and uh, no, he, he would look just like the other dogs. Maybe a little longer, a little rangier, but 
but basically it would look now this dog here does he have some weimaraner in him uh yeah probably somewhere down the line but not a lot just a little bit you know and does that weimaraner does it uh, keep him from being a good dog does it keep him from fetching does it keep him from learning quickly does it keep him from being good with kids no no and, and most certainly doesn't keep him from playing in the water because you can see that here with what we're doing you know so when you go to throw in those uh when you go to throwing those dilutes under the bus, I understand your position, okay, I really do. But I think what you have to accept is that they're here to stay and they're gaining in popularity every day. And so the best bet is to just accept the fact that, until we get a better genetic testing anyway, just accept the fact that some people threw some Weimaraner in the mix back in the day. You can go ahead and hold on to believe in that. And the people that are purest in, in terms of, uh, of the dilute saying it was there all along, they can go to believe in that. And let's take all this energy that gets spent arguing and, uh, you know, put it in a more constructive place. Or at least that's my perspective. And listen, I'm a guy that's in the trenches. I'm out here every day dealing with these dogs. This is not just internet talk to me. Like I get these dogs down at my kennel and I have to find a way to get them to come, to be still, to have good manners, to have the proper amount of environmental socialization. And I for sure have to make sure that they're good with uh, children and visitors because I have a, you know, children and visitors a day, you know? So I'm telling you those dilutes can do that. Now, back to my own bias, all dogs want to be labs, all labs want to be black. So if you guys want to restrict the <laughs> restrict Labrador registration to just black ones, you know, hey, send me an email. I can get behind that answer. But if you're not going to restrict it to just black dogs, then come on, let's be a little accepting. Let's reach across that aisle and tell people that are breeding these dilutes that, uh, you know, we understand they're not really evil people. All right, that's my little preaching for the day. I'll see y'all later.